Good, good morning to America, says Jean-Paul Jean Florin, and to South Africa, good afternoon, and good evening to Australia, Pacific, and Asia, so that I can greet you all, because we are a worldwide community, and we can probably feel how we're all together at all these different times in the time zones. My name is Jean-Michel Fleurin. I am the co-lighter with Uli Hurte here, and I will give a brief introduction. Yesterday, the conference started with a large picture, an immense picture from by Hans, Hans Uli Schmutz, Ulrich Schmutz, over millions of years, and we saw how the Earth, in connection with the Sun and with the planets, how there's an interplay and there's an this builds an organism, and there are rhythms there built up over millions of years, and how the rhythms change, and not like a machine with different cycles. And this picture that we got, we ended with this picture, with these rhythms. There's been quite a strong break, almost you could say a breakdown, of these rhythms. The, all the carbon that has been taken out of the earth through the coal, the gas and the oil, and what is happening with our earth organism and our cosmos. And then, in the, later on in the evening of the day, depending where you live, with the so-called future labs, we got a little bit closer to the Earth. And with these two contributions, we could see how perhaps we... Um, how, in a special way, we can connect with the land even as a consumer, as a citizen or as a farmer, the land between the farm and the whole world. And here there is this possibility of where we can act and where we can work on the future climate of our Earth. And we can see how our nourishment, how the nourishment systems that we use, there's a lot of possibility that we can work with if we can understand with, if we can understand the landscape between consumers, farmers and all the different people con concerned. And today, this afternoon, we want to take another step, and we have the two colleagues here, and they had this idea to have the Earth as the substance of our destiny. And this breeze brings a different layer. We touch into a different layer of Earth and humankind. And Constanza Kalix and Oli Hurte are going to use the dialogue form, dialogue lecture. And they, we're very happy that they're going to try this out. And we're also excited about this, a dialogue lecture. And I hand over to... Constanze Kalix, for those of you who don't know her, she was teaching, teacher and tutor in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And she has a heart for the youth, for the young people, even for the older young people. She was a m mathematics teacher. And I enjoy working with her. She's a, she's a colleague of mine in the leadership, cir leadership circle in the Goetheanum. She's quite a philosopher. And we speak about the human being with the 
So instead of talking about our s surroundings in a circumference, as in a circle, we should talk about our surroundings as an ellipse and perhaps this will bring us new ideas and new experiences when we think about the earth as a substance of our destiny. Uli Hurta, he is a farmer and that's really his life's task, you could say. For 30 years He's been working with the earth, with the animals, with the plants on his biodynamic farm in, in Switzerland. He brings a very different perspective and you will see this from two different continents. So there's this positive tension between the two and we would like, we would enjoy to experience what comes out of this, something new could come out of this. And just a little notice, if you have questions, you can write down the questions in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen, and they will be collected, and at the end of the dialogue lecture, we will see which questions we can answer. Thank you very much. Good luck for the experiment. So, I would like to describe our, our dialogue. We will try to build up pictures. And these are pictures to this very complex questions of breathing in the climate crisis complex because there are certain areas, the e ecological, the spiritual, and we will see out of these areas which that people who come into the world as young people and those people who work on the earth as farmers and we will also show a few pictures, f photographs, by a Brazilian photographer, Sebastião Salgado. There are six pictures, photos, by him, out of different books that he's published. You can see them on the pictures. And the first pictures are from his book called Genesis. He'd experienced the pain, the fleeing wars, people in flight, people who were people who were in difficult phases on the earth, but were able to experience the beauty. And he he applies this to nature, and there is this relationship between nature and the human being. And in his book, Gold, you see how those people who are looking for gold, searching for gold in the previous century, how they were digging for gold with their hills, uh, digging in a hill with their hands. And they were really hoping, searching for gold. In his introduction to his book, Exodus, where people are in flight, he wrote, in 1999, good and evil are nowadays inseparable because we know about both sides. These photographs show a part of our present. We cannot afford to look the other way. And that is almost a motto, you could say, for these photos, these pictures that we want to bring by Sebastio Salgado, where Uli and I feel the same. We cannot afford to look the other way. To be on the earth, to seek the sky, 
From farmer to climate farmer, from earth caretaker to climate caretaker. As a farmer, my back is bent. I look downwards. I work on the earth. Men and women, our backs are bent. We look down towards the earth. We work with the earth, for the earth, with the earth. Out of the earth, the fruits come out of our, for our lives. They bring, the earth gives us our yield. Everything that our whole life is the earth. Our profession is the earth. And the story about this earth that I work is my s story. Generations have worked on this piece of earth. Whether they are my forefathers or whether they are people that I am connected with, that we work at the same place. And this landscape that we work with our hands, that we have a task to work with, and it asks us to look downwards to the earth, the whole of our life, working downwards into the earth. And if I, in this way, looking down into the earth, then I experience perhaps in summer, in spring, in spring of 2017, where even in April, early f for us, where it should be fresh and spring green, there was dust when the cows were on, on the meadows because it was already so dry. And the sun, even in April, didn't warm the earth, but burnt the earth. And when in the early of summer 2016, a very wet spring on the 29th of May, there was a weather front. The weather didn't move on. It stayed and it circled around us and it rained and rained and rained until the earth couldn't hold the water anymore and it flowed away. The whole of the earth flowed away. The shock that this earth that I had been worked on for years and years over a long period of time had stayed there. There was only just an open wound in the landscape of this field. These are not exceptions. In many places where we travel to, with, doc with farmers where we have contact with, these are their experiences day in, day out. And about five years ago, one could, when one was with the farmers, des describing this, and you might have asked, is this perhaps climate change? And now, 2020, 2021, it's quite clear this is climate change. So instead of looking down into the earth, we look up. If something doesn't come from above or if too much comes from above, you lift your eyes up. And the yield doesn't come just from below but it comes from above, from the heavens. And we must learn. We must learn through these experiences, through these damage, through this damage, to think deeply about this, to re reflect. And maybe we need to realize that these pictures, these pictures that are pictures of suffering in our agriculture, that we need to Re -look, re recreate them. The old picture is the plant grows from below to above, from the earth to the heavens. And I'm going to try and create a new picture. The plant grows from above downwards. The plant grows from above downwards. That's not possible. I can't see it. But let's try step by step try and understand this, try and learn this, try and grow into this new, new picture. Light, 
warmth, air. That is what the plant can take up. It drinks the light. It drinks the light where it has its outer organs. It grows. It constitutes her its body. It transforms light and carbon dioxide from the air into its life substance and into starch, not down but up, up where it lives with the heavens. And then these sweet substances, these sunny heavenly substances, it leads down through her vessels into her other organs, down into the roots, and they don't just stay in the roots, but through the root hairs, they, these sugars and starches are excreted into the rhizosomes, to the rhizosphere, and they waken the earth. And we see in this picture, even the earth is enlivened from above through this light, warmth, sugar, and the plant is able to give this off, give this out. And the minerals, calcium, nitrogen compounds out of the humus are able to come into the plant along with the sap and from the inside out to support it and to make the plant appear to us. But the plant grows from above downwards because it is this messenger from the heavens, because it brings the heavens down to the earth. And this picture, the plants grow from above downwards, is new. It's new for me as a farmer, for me as a caretaker of the earth. And now farming has become taking care of the climate. I'm not just an earth caretaker, I'm a climate ta caretaker. The earth has become a piece of heaven. The earth, the climate belongs to the earth. The earth is part of climate. This part of the, this piece of earth that I have, that belongs to me, I am, I am responsible for this piece of earth, from this piece of heaven and climate heaven. I'm responsible for this and I'm no longer just earth caretaker or farmer, but I am climate caretaker or climate farmer. And how is this with my cows? What is it with my cows? My dear cows that I have on my bi biodynamic farm, when the, farms li when the cows lie on the meadow, and they ruminate, and once again ruminate, and ruminate again. I have, as a climate caretaker, I have a problem. Because what comes out of this ruminating, a methane gas, methane clouds, I don't actually see it, but I know it, CH4, a carbon compound, methane gas comes out of the r ruminations of the cows, the m metabolism of grass. Technologically, mathematically, this is an apparent problem for climate and the World Wildlife Fund and Greenpeace say to us, cows are a negative climate balance, they are a problem. And somehow, yes, there are a lot of young people nowadays who are vegans because they've heard this. And I don't want to hear, go into mathematical problems, mathematical sums. We've had a lot of that. And we know that that's important in the climate. And we know there is a pro problem, but we want to deepen these issues. And there's an expert group, a workshop for this, and this will take place on Sunday between 3 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, if you're interested. 
But now I'm going to the picture image of these new pictures that we're trying to create. And with my new way of looking, my new perspective, I see that this heavy cow, these heavy cows, these earthly animals are actually very light. They carry. The cow in the whole of her stomach carries enormous amounts of feed in her stomach, stomachs. Her f stomach is full of heavenly substance. She carries the heavens in her stomach. She almost flies because of this. And therefore, she should be able, she almost flies off. And she has this incredible potential to build humus. And she can concentrate all of this down into her manure and when you use the manure in the compost it will densify your compost so it becomes very good humus and she is almost you could say the creator of our cir circulation of this all the processes that take place on the farm all the processes that go from plants to cow, to compost, to into the earth and grow up again in plants. And without these animals, we couldn't really stay on one in one place. We would be nomads. We would not be able to settle down in the way that mankind became settled. We, over generations, man became settled and stayed in one place. And it was this power, this force that lives in the cow. And we could say this is a rep representative of all animals holding all the heavens in her stomach, holding all of one place in her stomach, able to make us settled in one er er area. If you want to build roots, you need a force. When you want to put roots down, you need a force that pulls the whole world to one place. And one place, the representative of the whole earth. And that is the cow that helps us manage that. She brings the whole heavens to one place, into the earth. And this earth, this place becomes my living place. And this has a place where I can live because it has a life sheath around it. And that's why I can live there and hold the earth there. And therefore, the climate ecology needs a sheath around it, a skin, an envelope, to create an earth and climate space around it, a co-creative, we, we want to become a genii loci, co-creatively with the animals, the space and the human beings. And to be the climate caretaker means to not to use up the earth, but with new impulses, we can breathe with the climate. If I want to be a caretaker of the climate, a climate caretaker or a climate farmer, I want to have a regen regeneration place where I can work for the climate, nurture the climate. And I ask the young generation, can you help us? Can you help us to realize this new picture? So what does it need? You said, Uli, when you put down roots, you need a force that pulls the whole world to one spot together. And that is almost, you could say, the gesture of birth, the signature of birth. Birth takes place at one spot. And then all sorts of rooting takes place that makes life possible. On this earth, we need to find the conditions to exist, to live here in this transformed by human beings, worked by human beings, 
my destiny can be written, can be inscribed. And we have heard, and you mentioned this, the climate youth, the young people working with the climate from 2019 onwards, speaking loudly out into the world, is the earth possible that my des destiny can be inscribed into it? Are there enough conditions that the inscribing of this is possible? And what are the con conditions? The conditions are the development, the possibility that with each human being in the world can change the world, can transform the world. And entering into this, entering into the world is only possible through the care of a surrounding. In order to come into the earth, in order to enter this, is one needs to be affirmed into this earth. And coming into the earth, if you come into the earth, it's an ecological act, you could say. It is connected with your surroundings, connected with the place, with the people, with everything that has all this potential that makes it possible or not possible. We need this sheath, we need the sheath of the other, the mother's sheath, the carer's sheath, and this sheath expresses itself that the child can experience trust. It is wanted that the people present, it is wanted, it is loved, that the earth and the people expect it, can receive him. And this reception, this receiving of these, is a continual task of society. Oh, it, is it possible that we as society nowadays ca meet this task? On one hand, this is a question uh, to the surroundings, but it is also part of our time, a question of our time, of our present. What responsibility do we take on as a society that the ones who are coming into the earth have the power, the force of their arriving, of their becoming, that they will find the right conditions that will allow them to, that was never been here before, to bring what has not yet been into the becoming of the world, to weave it into reality. Education always takes place between preservation, conservation, and change or transformation. We relate what has become, to learn what has become, is to inscribe ourselves in the process of becoming human. Can this inscribing be done in such a way that it provides help to that which cannot yet be narrated because it is newly en entering. And this is like a sheath for the new child coming in. Right from the beginning, each child, each person me meets the fact that only through being a human being we recognize ourselves through other human beings. Sheath is warmth. Sheath is affirmation, affirming the existence of the other through loving care, loving attention. It is always something specific, and it's always through someone else. Today, through someone else. Today, millions of children are hungry, Millions of children can't go to school because they have to work or because the surroundings do not allow because perhaps there are no school, schools there where they live. Millions of children are on, in flight and there are so many young people who do not have this sheath, 
this envelope, the skin around them. Creating this sheath is ecolo ecology in the widest sense. And the condition of being that is related to every single child is from the beginning an ecological question. And that this child does not become a sh does not receive a sheath, that it doesn't experience that it is wanted or that it is loved, is a question to the present. And this each one of us can do something about this. She's now quoting Hannah Arendt. No being, as far as it appears, exists for itself. Every being is to, perceive, to be perceived by someone. Not the human being inhabits this planet, but humans. The plurali plurality is the law of the earth. Hannah Arendt on the life of the spirit. Plurality is the law of the earth. If the new child grows, it grows into its childhood and the conditions of its being is that it needs to be seen. It needs to experience. It needs to be recognized. It must be recognized and it needs to learn to recognize the world. It needs to learn to see that the world has an incredible richness, a richness, a multiplicity, and everything that you can imagine of plants, of animals, of human beings. Everything lives on this world, a world that is, amazes us in its amazing beauty, in its always newly in its new growth. Can we be amazed? Can we be like a child and learn to see this world as a child does, being amazed? And can we learn out of this wonder to connect ourselves with this reality? So this reality calls us back, that we want to affirm it, that we want to create it and recreate it. We could say the climate crisis has put a center stage, our question whether a space exists where being wanted can exist for the children who are arriving, for the people who are arriving on this earth. And now, through this last year, the pandemic brings us the question of this incredible isolation in which so many young people and children and even older people have had to live through, is it possible that these children and young people really feel recognized, feel seen, feel heard? Who sees me? Who sees me in a way that I know that I exist? Millions of children and young people cannot go to school and many do not have the possibility even to use digital forms to experience themselves. For the consciousness of the school, of the institution, who has the task to bring the beauty and the multiplicity of the world to the children, for this institution, many millions of children are unseen by these in institutions. But it's not just children who are unseen. There are millions of people who are unseen. The children do not know themselves to be seen. And there are millions of people who are live in poverty, live in seg segregation, and these are also ways of making people unseen, unrecognized. 
And now there are many young people throughout the whole world who stand before a future with very little hope, very little possibilities for their future. If they are not able to go to school, they are not able to go to any educational institutions, the possibility of creating their future becomes very difficult. And these people are the first people who've been, who will be affected, have been affected by the climate catastrophes of all the things that affect us in our destiny. And in the 2020 report of UNESCO, they said this has been a year like no other. This has been a year like no other. The COVID pandemic created the most severe disruption to global education systems in history, forcing more than 1.6 billion learners in over 190 countries out of school at the peak of the crisis. And Audrey Azoulay, the general director of UNESCO, said on the 25th of March that this is a real challenge. Every situation needs a worldwide coalition for ed for education. Education is a social question. 100 years ago, Rudolf Steiner took this as the starting point for his educational approach. Being able to enter into the multiplicity of the world is a question for society. The society is responsible for, for this. They must be responsible that each person is known that they are seen. If this doesn't take place, we can't breathe. So we've just had living on the earth, reciprocity, learning to see, being seen. And now we're going on to how can we breathe socially? And Uli Hurt has been saying, if the social breathing stops, the social climate stops. How can we keep the social cohesion from slipping away from us? And especially we need this between the old and the young generation. I'm an older farmer, says Uli, but we need this. This is absolutely necessary. Greta Thunberg speaks about this as an ultimate necessity for the urgency before we go into a climate, climate collapse. And Uli asks, will we be raping the social climate? in order to save the e e ecology. The ecological climate is, of course, can't wait, but the social climate is also very fragile. Each group has priorities. Each group has a right. How can we accept this multiplicity? How can we protect it? How can we support it? And at the same time, how can we do something together? This is a real question. I don't know the answer, but I do know that perhaps out of my life experience as an older farmer, that in the social we need to breathe. Breathing means breathing in and breathing out. It means taking and giving, giving and taking. It means I and you. Each one needs to breathe but we breathe in the common air. How can we want to will together? How can we will together as people, as humanity, so that the social breathing doesn't stop? Constanza, you said each person must be seen. For children, it is the school as a social place, as a place where beyond the family, the society says, you're welcome, dear child, we see you, you belong to us. 
And often it is the school also where children have might have their only warm meal of the day. And not just children have their social embedding. It's not just children who have lost their social embedding in through the pandemic. Many people are now homeless. I was absolutely shocked when I saw the pictures in India where millions of workers who were sitting, sitting just as though they were stranded because the big towns, the big towns with their, they, it, it was as though the large cities had spat them out through the lockdown. They were looking for new work. They are very flexible in these large, flexible structures of the cities and they make everything possible because they are available for work in every day. They have no fixed job, they have no fixed place to stay. Lockdown takes place and it's so these people are pushed out, pushed out of the system and they just sitting there, they have no income, they have no nothing to eat when when evening comes and this has a consequence for their homes for their villages far away where they were if you like pulled out of their villages to the modern life to the cities there are no buses anymore there are no trains anymore and they can only walk and hundreds and thousands of kilometers these people walked back to their villages. Why? What, what did they expect in their village? They wanted a piece of earth, a piece of their own earth, the earth of their family, of their community. Earth gives nourishment, but not anymore. The earth in this way, when is uprooted, when one is in flight, when it is one, when one is spat out of the enormous cities, out of one's norm, so-called normal life, being a human being, this this possibility of being an I in myself, that gives me the possibility of saying, I am dignified. I am a dignified human being. I support myself on this that I have a piece of earth, a piece that is mine, that I can relate to this piece of earth, that I can have this r relationship with earth where I can realize myself. A piece of earth gives me, gives you, gives everybody our human dignity. What am I without a piece of earth? As far as the earth goes, we are individuals, each one a piece of himself. And if, uh, if we look at the whole earth climate and look at the pandemic and all the connections, we have this in common. How can we, how can we realize being an individual and being a community in the social as aspect? Food comes from the earth on one hand, it also comes from the heavens, as we've just seen. It is a gift from the heavens, the gift of a healthy climate. And for the climate, we are r responsible in a communal way. Communal means together. Can we manage that? Are we able to find our way towards this communal will? We need a new social contract, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau said. Before the French Revolution, Rousseau spoke about this. In the old society, he spoke about this. And a communal will, a social will, for others, with others, for all, with all, a social contract. That is what we need. We need a new social contract. 
across all regions of the earth for the climate. But uh, eating nourishment comes from the earth and as far as the earth is concerned we are not all even, all the same. We, there are haves and ha have nots. Some have a lot of earth, some have very little earth. Some have a good earth to farm, some have bad earth to farm or less good earth to farm. We are very different as far as the earth is concerned. Between the heaven and the earth, between the earth and the climate, nourishment comes into being, food comes into being. But the food is not available for all, but it's only for some. We are individuals in the light of food. What some people can eat, other people can't eat. The apple that I eat, the other person cannot eat the same apple. But all apples grow and ripen under the same heavens, under the same climate. But we do need a new social way of breathing, the way we can differentiate between being the individual and being the same. And where is our earth and the way we share our earth's destiny? So now we come to part five, the decision to participate. The earth is a substance of my destiny. And where each one of us is separate, where the newborn child is loved, where it knows to need, that it needs to know it is loved, and the child can grow, that it is oh, that it is awaited, that it is seen, so that its conditions of being can be experienced. It is recognized. I, that I, that I am, and the I that I become in the meeting with the others, in the meeting with the world, I, as unexchangeable, as a very particular, I am recognized for me, for the I that I am. And in this way, I learn to recognize who I am and for whom I am. Who am I and for who, who am I? From this I learned to recognize who I am and for whom I am. And this was said by the, in 2014, the French sociologist Alain Tourin published in 2014 how a society can work with equality in a public space and how isolation in a private space. space. But to have the equality and the differentiation as two aspects of the human being, as the human being in the way that a human being is always in becoming, that can be understood and can we live together equal and different. That is the name of his essay. And this is our question, which we need to ask ourselves in society, that I should ask myself and that, that our times ask us. Can we live together, equal and different, in our archetypal individuality? Or, as Steiner said, can I understand the other as another, from what he is? from the conditions in which he lives, the concrete other human being who, as Emmanuel Levinas says, as I have a face, he has a face, which asks me a question, inquires of me, and challenges me to take up my task, to think of him, to allow him 
to be in what he is. So we are, we live in our own, the other who is a presence in the world as I am a presence and learn to answer from the presence as an answer, as a response, not as a reaction to being asked by the world, by the other. I'm learning to live my relationship with myself, with what I'm dealing with, with what occupies me in the face of others, of the earth, of the need for a third person. It's no longer enough that I live in togetherness. Society is a space in which the third person enters, in which it must be recognized, just as a young person learns to be in the world through being recognized through another. This is a challenge that comes from the outside. Nature continually asks us. It is, it accompanies my conscious consciousness. Can we learn to, in our actions, through the reality, to bring this third person into us, the call from the other person brings to me responsibility. It can be a human being, it can be nature, it can be our future together. The other asks me and I answer. Connectedness weaves itself there. Their destiny arises, shared destiny, although it is my destiny, it is shared destiny. We owe the earth the synchronicity to live with the other. And this is the reality of the earth. It becomes in the acceptance of our responsibility it becomes the substance of my destiny. So now we're on the sixth part of our talk. The earth needs my footprint, my destiny or our des destiny. And I want to look at the sixth picture here. I want to try and take up this point of destiny. We live in a cultural and spiritual climate next to the e ecological climate. Our culture is built on the eye. The eye is our base on which we look out into the surroundings. If I'm looking down onto the earth as a farmer, and perhaps most of us are a bit more farmers than we realize, if we are looking downwards, the eye is always looking downwards. And if this is my basis, this is how I react, how I feel, how I think in, in the world. And if I can raise my gaze to the horizontal level, to the social level, and I meet the other eyes, and I have a movement, there is a central point, and there is a breathing, breathing in, breathing out, and there is an I and you, and this point becomes movable, becomes flexible, depending in what sort of social movements I find myself. And when the gaze rises up, when it moves from the horizontal upwards, it does it lose this carrying, it does not lose this carrying I quality, the eye carrying quality. Do I lose my eye when I look upwards? Myself, my eye is in my true self. If I just look up for a moment, but I actually hold my consciousness up and be in a sphere, I would come into an atmosphere, into a peripheral eye experience, 
can I ex can I stay in this peripheral I experience? This is a question f for me. I feel if we're all our just our if we all with our eyes look upwards, there will be a lot of questions that we now have. We will not be able to just lose. We will not be able to just dissolve them. We can't work out of cause and effect. Cause and effect is not the answer. We not, don't want to have an additive negative state in a causal mechanical state, but we want to be able to think and feel, to be able to feel, to be able to think and to be able to will, to be able to do things. And when Hans Ulrich Schmutz sh spoke about this, it became quite clear to me that we need the whole sphere, not just one of them. So let's go through this process once again. Our gaze is lifted from the earth to the he hectare, to the field, the field where the corn is above the earth. And where you see the corn growing, if you lift your gaze up to the trees and you see the crown of the trees, the top of the trees, and then you see the silhouettes of the trees, your gaze glides above the silhouettes of the trees, and then you see the hills, and then you see the high mountains behind, if you live in Switzerland, and then the sky, the heavens. You lift your eyes again to the rain clouds hanging deeply, or to the higher stratospheres, the clouds high up in the stratosphere, or perhaps to the blue sky above, the whole tent of blue sky above where the sun moves, changing through the sky, heavens, through the white moon and, the, and Venus, and right way, way, way to the outer planets, to Saturn, until I see right behind the zodiac circle. And I can almost just imagine this with my eye consciousness. I can just about hold this sphere of consciousness and hold my eye and hold this outer consciousness. And if I try and imagine going further into the incredible emptiness of space, I might be able to turn around and find in the middle this of the sphere I might find the earth. And the earth is no longer just a an earth, but it is now a whole part of this earth. And therefore, it, the earth has become part of me, is part of my eye. And the earth appears held within my eye, within my sphere of I, the whole outer sphere of my I, and it, the earth then belongs to my condition of being as an individual or as, my, as a cosmic consciousness. And all of us, we know this through the, through the myths of creation. And dear friends, dear farmers, we know these things, and we know that we are carried in this ancient consciousness and we meet in the sphere the, those who have died, those who made the earth fruitful b before us. And this way of looking into the past of the spheres where we meet the, those who have died, we can add a perspective into the future where we, together with all those people who are not, not yet born, with those people who are waiting to come into the earth, connecting to how you began, Constanza, the earth begins, the concrete, the exact specif specific earth of plants and animals, 
They belong to myself, to my eye, to your eye. The earth is not, not I. The earth is part of I, of my true self. And out of this conf consciousness, the earth calls. The earth calls. She doesn't say, I don't want your footprint, don't come to me. But she calls, I await. I await your footprint. And my answer could be, answering this call of our earth. I will go to you, I come to you, earth, and bring my contribution for our communal future. And I close with the title of this lecture. The earth is the substance of our destiny. Thank you very much for the rich and intense conversation lecture and I think there's a lot that we need to digest. But perhaps we have still some time for questions. Some questions have come in from the chat and also with me I also have questions. And a first subject is this question to Uli about the cow. How is it that, could you please explain, what is, where does this force come from? Where did this come from that we moved from nomads to settled peoples? And you said the cow was our helper. Perhaps you could say something about this. Where did this drive come from? And how did the cows help us? So this happened a few thousand years ago. So I can't remember exactly where this force came from. But it is something wonderful to be a farmer. And the farmer looks downwards towards the earth. I can't go into this so deeply. But I would say the joy that one can have working year after year on the earth. This joy is a different kind of a joy of traveling. Both are good. But this joy of being able to be an I, be, a, be oneself, because one stays in the same place and one works deeply, a deeper relationship to the earth. And perhaps 10, 12,000 years ago, that was probably one of the factors. And when you want to do this, then the earth, when you've done this for many years and one is connected with the earth, at first it's not possible. In the beginning you take more out of the earth than is possible, than nature can give us. And even if it's a good, pl good place and after a few decades and after three generations, you probably want to move. Because if you want to stay in the same place over hundreds of years, it's not possible. But the cows have a possibility that we don't have. The, grass, the cows take the grass and create manure. And if we use this manure on the earth, the manure is what it is an absolute wonder, it is an absolute miracle for, for the earth. Other animals also create manure, but the cow creates a very special manure. And without the animals, 
we would not be able to stay in one place. They would not be able to give us this sheath that our eye can stay in one place. So there are a few more questions that have just come in. And I'd just like to add this thought. You said the plant grows from above. And if you think this through, therefore the earth is densified climate. What the earth is, is what we've done to the climate above. Yes, yes, I hadn't thought of it like that in that way. And yes, says, yes, I think we can say it like this. I think by creating these new pictures, we create new gestures. If the Borden is densified climate, then over many, many years, thousands of years or millions of years, you will see a change in, in the earth. So yes, I find that right, rightful. A question for Constanze. The diversity of the different cultures and peoples, how can we recognize this? How can we work with this diversity? You said it was a necessity. How can we recognize this more? This is a very large and complex question. And I'll just answer to one aspect. The multiplicity is given within a land, within a culture, within a family. For the outside, we generalize things very e easily and we don't notice that there is diversity everywhere. Even as Hannah Arendt said, plurality is the principle of the earth. And if you think of a flower or a cow, each one is in, in individual. There is a wherever I look without recognizing something fully, I do see that there is diversity. And so we can move from gen generalizations and abstractions to looking at the at humanity, that we see diversity is our starting point. Diversity is the basic state of our hu human, human condition. No human being is the same as the other. And even tomorrow, the same human being has become something slightly different. And if I can't recognize this, if I can't see it, I fix the other in its state of non-development, of not being able to stay in becoming, in emergence. So if I really look at the specific individual human being before me, I see emergence, I see becoming, no matter which country, which population, which group. We can practice this with each human being. And if I can add something, climate is a very gen generalized issue. So how do you connect diversity to this. So in this last year, we've had a lot that has become vi visible, a lot of old tensions that live in society have become more and more visible during this, this crisis over the last year. And it is because of not recognizing the other that this has come into being. The other is completely radically different. And it's not a transformation of myself, not an extension of myself, but there's a total break. I am one and the other is the other in his differentness. And even if I don't accept this as reality, and I push against this, I become antipathetic, 
and I create a distance, and this is the way the climate question becomes a social question. How can I live with the reality that the other person is different, and this is a reality? Thank you. So now we're coming back down to earth. I have a little bit of a provocative question, it's not from me. Isn't it not arrogant to say my earth? Isn't one of the problems that one makes earth one's own property and that you say it is my earth? Thank you for the question. And in this word mine, are very different aspects. You can hear this Roman property, state of property, and you can have your borders and your milestones, and you can say that you have this property of mine reaches to this point. But I am relating the word my in a different way. I'm saying my in related to myself whether I'm borrowing this, whether I'm working this for someone else. It is a field, is it a garden, is it a meadow? But this piece of earth needs caring. It needs a human being or a group of human beings who say, I cultivate this piece of land. It's not just wild nature, it's culture, cultivated nature, culture. and. In this way, I care for it. And not just each year that we're going to give somebody a different piece of land, but I want to cultivate my piece of land for a while. And you work 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and you've worked on it for a while, and then you have to give it on to the next generation. That is one of the things about working the earth, that it takes place over generations and it is like a gen ge generational contract and it's not mine because it's not yours but it's my responsibility and it's not that I'm only responsibility for it and not for anyone else but that there is a generational responsibility. Thank you for that answer. And I really experience that when I go to different farms, that it's not whether it's your property or not, it's the way you work on it. And I can really follow what, what you were saying. Another question for Constanza. He's translating from English. So, he says the question already has its answer within it, that we are, we have abstract ideas about the climate and that is really the problem. And Constanza says, yes, this is more of a statement than a question and we need to, to work out of reality. As a teacher over many years, I have to try and bring the child, if I want to ex understand a child, I need to understand what the child is expressing, not to just understand the general concept of child. And we have almost learned to think abstractly about reality instead of thinking out of what is reality we think about reality and if I look at the child as a teacher what is the reality of this child this is a great challenge new and new again it is a challenge I really need to devote myself to this child reflect on this child, step back from this child, am I still connected with this child? Am I only with my ideas about the child? 
And now we've had the ellipse. We've just had the ellipse. Oh, that's wonderful. So if I can look out of the re reality and continually have a dialogue with myself about this reality, that the I which expresses out into the world, wider into the world, recognizing itself. If this I stands on the earth, then there's a dialogue with me and the other person, or me and the reality of the climate, or me and the objects I'm looking at, me and the child. So I am in an elliptical tension field, field of tension, where I'm not just in the center, of course, I do stand on one central point of the ellipse, and ellipse has two center points, points, me and relationship to that which I'm looking at. And that is a different sort of circle, a different sort of surrounding, a different sort of environment, an elliptical environment. Thank you. Thank you, that develops our sheath enveloping, taking it a step further into this elliptical phase. So now a question for Uli. What about your impulse and the impulse from Greta? What about these two impulses? So I hope that I didn't express myself in a way that I speak negatively about Greta, but the way some of the youth are calling out about the expressing themselves in a very um, single-minded way. It's just saying if you just follow the science and if you look at the pandemic, what's happening here in a very absolutist way. The pandemic and the science around the pandemic is killing our social as aspect and we need to breathe in the social aspect. And therefore, I would like to see more breathing in the climate attitudes and not to take them in a very um, one, in a, in a one-way thinking. If we just go to the state of emergency, then we haven't yet won, en won anything. We need to bring the social aspect into it and keep the social aspect into it, even, even as it is happening in the pan pandemic crisis. And in a certain way, you could say the pandemic has put the climate crisis into the background, but at the same time, we are learning that the climate crisis is very important. And there is this absolute emergency state. You cannot lean, you cannot support yourself on old ideas. You cannot use old ideas to support yourself anymore. But there's a plurality, a diversity nowadays that each day we need to take it a step further, develop our ideas and not just have a one-way street, have a one-sided attitude. So the COVID task force needs the social aspect to it. It needs the nourishment aspects. It needs psychologists. It needs sociologists. Then we will learn a lot more. And in that way, we will be able to work with the absolute emergency states that we are living in and this one-sidedness where people just say the one-sidedness when you just look at science it seems to get a little bit lost thank you these are perhaps good words to end with Constance is that okay for you too thank you we're very happy and to stay in this 